if you haven't done anything on social media analytics yet, don't, don't worry. I, I'll start off the session with some introductions to the topic. We'll touch upon thoughts around why we think there has been an increasing interest in this area, what the benefits are, and then to try and move on to how you would start your journey with social media analytics. I'll try and also keep the, most of the session demo-based, hoping to try and give you a flavor for some of the ways in which you might be able to take this back to your own organizations. Thoroughgood is a global business intelligence and analytics consulting firm. We are a global pool of consultants operating as a single integrated organization across the three countries that we have presence in. We do work with clients in a variety of sectors, in particular the consumer packaged goods and retail, financial and uh, insurance, and pharmaceuticals and healthcare. In terms of technology, Thoroughgood is an independent consultancy. The technology landscapes at our clients are almost always a heterogeneous mix of tools, and so we partner or work with all of the major software vendors as well as smaller targeted BI technologies. So to start off our session, let's start at looking at two specific pictures from the Internet, showing people's behavior at concerts about 20 years back and now. As you can see, back in the 90s, people would have gone to a concert to experience it fully and then gone away to talk about it. Whereas with all these technology advances today, what you find is that a good part of the audience is almost always busy capturing a video, clicking a picture, and to then share it with their friends many a times almost immediately or straight away. The latency in information sharing is almost zero. And look at the effect that has created and is expected to have on the volume of digital information created and shared on the internet. In fact, if you look at the last five years, the volume of data has grown almost by a factor of nine. I think that has also been fueled by the fact that the mobile phone market has seen a strong growth rate. And today, you know, you find people accessing internet on their mobile devices very often. The resulting situation, I think, presents such a great opportunity for people who love data, like me and you, and think of the insights that you might be able to drive from analyzing all of that information, all of the data. So how do social media analytics benefit businesses? As I understand, the majority of the analysis to date has been done by marketing teams. Social media gave them a platform to communicate directly with their customers at a very low cost, yet delivering very powerful marketing messages. Yes, that's indeed a great value. And so that area of social media management tool in itself is a rapidly growing space. There are many softwares uh, or solutions that are available today that allow you to manage your social media communications across different platforms that you see from one place. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you would have heard of Hootsuite, which is a great example of one such tool. However, there are many more benefits to social media than just using it as an enhanced marketing tool. With the right tools and architecture in place, it should also provide you with the ability to understand your customer better. So almost giving you information back from the Internet. And thus setting the stage for an improved customer service, for, as an example, Social media analytics could also be very helpful in developing insights around how you could tailor your product or your service to secure more business or to try and attract new customers. Before we go deeper into looking at different ways of analyzing social data, I think it would be useful for us to develop a good understanding of the social media landscape as it is. Social media has been an ever-changing complex ecosystem. There are new services created every year. There are some services that disappear every year, but mostly they all tend to evolve rapidly as they grow. This landscape diagram, I think, gives you a good feel for the large number of social media sites that are active today. Let's start on the networking part of this diagram in the bottom left. As I trace my own history of social media usage, I think this is what I have used it mainly for, you know, building up networks with my friends from universities. It's not changed much these days, only that the contacts are more often from work. Services like Friends Reunited 
and even Facebook, I think, you know, would trace the history back to college campuses. And networking continues to be a strong aspect of social media today. Take the case of LinkedIn, for example. They seem to be doing very well in the professional networking area, even in markets like China, where some of the top social media players have themselves not managed to establish a strong presence. So moving on from networking then, the natural follow-up for most users tend to be the publishing space. So this is the uh, left top corner piece that we're, of the diagram that we're looking at. So they're there either as a consumer or as a publisher themselves. So services like, uh, take the example of WordPress, uh, Blogger, LiveJournal, etc., have been finding themselves a good user community through their platform which provide the ability to host unidirectional communications, uh, for, like for example, blogs. Today, um, actually we run the risk that people assume that these blogs or services, like for example, Wikipedia, uh, can be treated as a prime source of knowledge. So moving on from publishing then, almost helped by the rapid development of technology, and as more and more users have been engaged in the social media space, we have seen a, a democratization of social media. What I really mean to say that is that there are a lot of services today that allow almost anyone to share their video, pictures, thoughts, etc. Think of the variety of users that you know yeah, that we put YouTube to today. You get university lectures or you know movie uh, songs, etc. And a video that goes viral on this network on YouTube hits a million views in a very short span of time. All of these different areas that we have looked so far together have given us a force and a very valuable set of sites or applications that allow us to have discussions online. For organizations looking to engage with their customers, I think that is their sweet spot, to be able to tap into what your customers are talking about, your brand or your service online. As we develop this framework around the applications in the social media world, I thought I'd also take a quick moment to pick up on WhatsApp, which you see on the discussing uh, set of applications there, to give ourselves a financial context. If you remember, Facebook recently purchased WhatsApp at a price of $19 billion. The return on investment of having a strong presence across all social media areas should then be definitely much higher than the investment that they make, I'm sure. By the way, uh, I didn't touch upon Facebook, Google, and Twitter, which is bang right there in the center, uh, only because they do have a strong presence across all these different areas that we talked about. So they, they've got a very strong networking, publishing, sharing, and a discussing piece. They're also the top three sites in the social media world. So how and where do you start the analysis journey? I think the first step is to try and collect the relevant data from different social media sites that are of interest to your business. Social media sites these days provide uh, interfaces or kind of services that would allow you to tap into the data that has been collected. And there are many ways to do that, some of which we'll come back to during our demonstrations later on. Once this data has been collected, you would then try to enrich the data by identifying the different attributes that are associated with it. Usually when anyone refers back to social media analysis, the general impression is that there is a lot of sentiment analysis going on and that it cannot always be trusted. I think that statement's partially true. Yes, yeah, there, there is a lot of sentiment analysis that you could do, and it's very hard to get the sentiment analysis right. But when we talk about enriching your data, or when we talk about identifying the attributes of a conversation, it is not always about sentiments. Some of the attributes like demographics, language, location, etc., will be equally, if not more powerful, than identifying the sentiment of a conversation. We'll also look at some of these entities during our demos later on. The information that you have thus gathered, you know, collected from different sources, enriched with all the attributes that you could find, is then made available for further reporting and analysis. That's, I think, is your final part of your journey, or uh, where you start off your real value, uh, seeing the value back from social media analysis. Today, there are a number of vendors providing platforms that enable you to tap into the social data. 
The list of providers has been growing too, almost like the number of social media services themselves. Let us pick a few names from this list that I have got on my slide here. I mentioned Hootsuite earlier. Hootsuite is being used by a lot of companies these days um, as a platform for managing their presence across different social media sites. So again, just to send a content out or a marketing message out to Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, etc. at the same time. Apart from allowing you to manage your messages across these sites, I think what Hootsuite does is also it gives you a neat snapshot of your companies or brands social media profile, so kind of tells you, you know, what's your followers like, have you been getting more traction of late, and, and just that high-level snapshot of analysis back on your brand or your service. Let's look at Topsy on the left side there. They were in the news recently, at the end of last year, really, um, as they were bought out by Apple. Topsy.com is a real-time search engine for social posts and socially shared content, content that's primarily on Twitter and Google+. So it's almost like a free search engine like Google or Bing, only that it's focused on social data. They're also one of the four companies that have access to Twitter's Firehose. So the commercial pro analytics offering from Topsy allows corporates to conduct interactive analysis on keywords and authors by activity, influence, sentiment, language, etc. Another company like Topsy is Genif, again on the right side now. GNIF is a social media aggregation company, really. So, uh, and they were in the news as well recently as they were bought out by Twitter themselves. What GNIF does is it pretty much sort of aggregates data from Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and again, a, a wide variety of different sources and streams it out to your API. So you have the ability to tap into social data from one location. A pretty much very well known name in the area is Salesforce. Uh, again, they have packaged their offering on the social media space across the three different products into one product which is called the Exact Target Marketing Cloud. As part of this offering, of, as part of this marketing suite, they also offer a product called Radiant 6, again, which was purchased by social, uh, Salesforce in, in 2011, and that has access to Twitter Firehose as well and can listen to social data. The other sort of aspects of the marketing cloud is things like Buddy Media and Social.com, which allow you, again, like Hootsuite does, pretty much to manage your messaging across different social media sites, and again, just to give you that impact from a marketing perspective. Amongst all of these, for today's session, I'll be using Data Sift for our discussion, uh, mainly because I've been working with this technology for, with a number of our customers. They, again, have access to Twitter's Firehose, so you have the ability to get historical data, uh, through Data Sift, uh, and interestingly, they've also been partnered with Tableau since last year, and together with uh, the offering from Google BigQuery, I think the, the value proposition for anyone who's interested in testing the social media analytics space is really high, so it's very easy from, from an end-user perspective to start your journey on the whole social media analysis piece, um, and it's been proven right by the number of POCs that we've run with some of our customers. So what does Data Sift do? Data Sift helps us to address the first two stages of our social media analysis journey that we discussed earlier, so the bit around collecting the data and enriching it. Datasift provides the ability to collect data from more than a dozen different platforms. I've listed down a few uh, sort of uh, icons in there on the aggregate column on the left side, uh, and they allow you to collect this data at varying levels of social interaction, so you can actually go back and define what you're looking to listen to and uh, to, you know, define the different attributes around the data that you want to, that you are interested in. And they then provide, the second aspect of their service is the processing capability through which you can filter and categorize this either real-time or historical data with additional attributes and metrics. And as I said, the, the biggest part is the ability to do all this process through a web-based interface uh, where you can go back and sort of, you know, tick mark to say the, define the data sources that you're connected to, uh, that you're connecting to, and then select the, define the criteria that you're using to filter that data down, and then define the data destinations, et cetera, all through a web-based interface. It's been very neatly done. The data that you have collected can actually be delivered through different mechanisms. So you can actually have a push connector that sort of pushes it out to your databases. You could actually get the data on demand through a pull service, or you can even stream it out. Uh, when we did our 
proof of concepts or some of the projects that we're doing, we've used a variety of these different options. Uh, majority, again, as I talked about the value proposition earlier on, majority of the work tends to be around data shift and pushing it down into Google BigQuery. But you can also get that data uh, through into MySQL databases or as a JSON file. JSON files are pretty much a flat file structure that you can then connect to for your analysis. Let us now jump into one of the demos that I had planned in for today uh, and look at an example of this kind of analysis. The data that I have been chosen for this analysis is all around World Cup. And I've chosen Microsoft Excel for my first demo because I wanted to share the capabilities to do an early stage analysis using an everyday tool like Excel. So we've been listening to conversations on social media around FIFA World Cup uh, by tracking the hash World Cup hashtag. So that's what we've been listening to. So we've gone into these different uh, data sources and said that we are interested in any conversations that are happening over that period, over the period of the World Cup, to say anything that mentions hash World Cup. Yeah? We then used DataSift to collect this data, and some of that data was then processed through a JSON file. Now, as I mentioned, JSON files are, uh, is a very, it's used very often. It's a very flat file structure. What I love about it is that it's a file format that, has, uh, that works very well with attribute value pairs, and I'll show you an example on, on Excel as we get into it. It's been primarily used for transmitting data between a server and web application, so it works very well for, in cases of streaming information down for analysis. Um, and it's also great when you have multiple repeated objects uh, within the same set of content. So uh, these days it's very often that you find people tweeting a picture of, say, maybe a, a, a goal or themselves with, you know, watching a match, and then you'd have a, a flurry of hashtags that follow up, uh, some which makes and some which don't. But again, JSON has the capability to structure all of this into a, so it's a, it's a kind of semi-structured uh, file uh, files saving mechanism. Right. On our data, then we, we use DataSift to bring all of this data into JSON, and then we are powering the data into Microsoft Excel. Um, and I'll be using what's called Microsoft Excel a Power Query, which is an add-in for Excel uh, that allows you to connect and search data online. So uh, I will not try and explain it in words. Let's jump into the demo, and we'll have a look at how this all pans out. So on my screen now, I'm now moving into Excel. So I've got, I've got an instance of Excel running in here. Um, if you can see, I'm now selecting the Power Query add-in uh, from the ribbon, and there are different options for me to connect to data. So I can go for an online search. I could collect to data from a web, uh, from different file systems. I could connect to data that's held in a database or from other sources. Just to show you an example of Power Query, uh, if I did an online search and search for something like uh, World Cup attendance, just to try and see, you know, the, get a number for number of people who are attending these World Cups uh, matches live. It gives me a flurry of options in terms of it's gone, gone ahead and searched online for different data sources and come back and said, well, it's found something, a table from Wikipedia, and it's giving me a snapshot. It gives me year, total attendance, number of matches, and average attendance. Uh, and I can see that there are different options that it has found from, a, you know, from the online search. I can now double-click that particular data if I'm interested in it, um, and let's see, you know, it should open up in a different sheet on Excel, uh, allowing me to, you know, see that data in reality. So I've, I've got the data there. Uh, in order to add that data into, um, into my Excel model, I can go back and say I'm interested in, in bringing this data through, and that's the data from table. And from an end-user perspective, you can carry on to do some changes, make some changes or some some level of ETL on this data to try and shape it up to make sure that it fits in with your your excuse me your requirements. So things like, for example, it's got a column called key, and I'm not interested, so I can take that off. I can say remove that column. And notice as I make those changes, Power Query is making a list of all the applied steps that I have applied to that data. So it's making it's making note that I've removed the columns. Uh, I could go back and add another column, so I could say that I'd like to insert a custom column. In this instance, I've got an average already being calculated, but if it wasn't, I could say, let's get a total attendance divided by the number of matches, and that will give me an average value that, that can, that's shown up there. And again, it shows me that I've added in and inserted a custom column. I'm really not interested in the data. I just wanted to give you a quick flavor for Power Query. So if I, if I discard that, but I'd 
I will look at what I have done with the native JSON file. So we've gone through the same process, and as you can see, the number of steps that I've applied on the JSON file is, is quite, there are quite a lot of steps that we've put that through. If I start at the source, this is what a record on JSON file looks like. So if I click on the second record in there, it kind of tells me the details of what that record looks like. So there you go, it's telling me demographic, uh, it's got a gender of male, the next one is it's got a set of application uh, record, uh, details around Facebook. Starting with application, it tells me you know it's, that particular post has been made by, from Facebook for Android. Uh, it's been created by a particular type, created at, and the description, etc. So that's the level of detail that's held in the JSON file. Using Excel and using Zadin, you can then put that through a series of transformations to say bring back the columns that you're interested in, change the filter the rows expand the rows that you're interested in to finally get to a data set that looks like looks neat and can be used for analysis. I think it's a very neat tool, especially if you're trying to um, mash up data from different data sources and put it all together. And when you're done with that, you can actually load it into the data model. The bottom right, you can see the option to say, you can either load it into the worksheet or load it into the data model, at which point the data is then available for you for further analysis. What I have done is, in the interest of time, I have cleaned up the data and I've got a Twitter feed here that I have uh, that we can start doing our analysis on. So let's click on that and let's say I'm interested in inserting what's called a power view uh, sheet. So let me create a new sheet. What this does is, power view provides the ability to go back and look at all these different uh, data sets that we have available for analysis and create your own uh, charts or representation. Let me delete that uh, bar chart there and I'll start off with Twitter feed. So if I clicked on, say, for example, number of authors and I wanted to say see a uh, bar chart by day, it gives me a grid to start off with, but I can change that to a cluster column and that should now change to give me a bar chart of what has been the activity. So number of authors that have been engaged during the period of the World Cup is what we're looking at. And we've got data from 19th of June through till about the 13th, so the final happening on the 13th of July. What I can also do is try and bring in uh, Twitter handles. So I've got a Twitter username in here and Twitter user URLs. But what I've also done is I've merged this data along with some player summary that I've collected online. So I can go back and say I'm interested in bringing back player names as the as the analysis, so let me just quickly undo that. I intended to create a new sheet, uh, a new chart with the play, player name details in there. The data set that we have collected is the top 30 players. So I've gone into whoscored.com and then looked at their ratings based on different aspects, like things like you know, how many assists, how many goals have they scored, what's their pass percentage, etc., number of red cards and yellow cards that they've got, etc., to try and get to a rating. So I've got the top 30 players that we are interested in there. And you can carry on with this analysis. You can actually use that particular player name as a slicer, and then you can say, uh, bring me back any conversations that's happening around Lionel Messi. And you can see that the bar chart now gives you a number of authors by day, and it tells me wherever Messi has been uh, mentioned, this is the activity that's been happening over the you know, around World Cup. And again, um, you can get really crafty with sort of you know developing an application there. And what I've done here is to do a quick dashboard, just to again giving us the details of everything around that hash World Cup uh, data that we've collected. Uh, like I've got I've got a bar chart that gives me a tweets by day. So again, you can see the trend there. I've got the player names listed down on the left here. I've got two more charts. What you can do is I've given out a list of interactions. So these are the details, the actual uh, content of the Twitter text or you know the Facebook post, etc. I've also got um, the, the the different authors who have been talking about this particular instance. So again, you can see that there is a card view of the different authors that we are interested. Um, ordered by the most influential people right at the top. And again, we'll come back on to the influential rating later on during my second demo. The, the functionality of this dashboard you can click through. So again, if you look at Lionel Messi, for example, it tells me what the tweeting has been, and you would expect that to be the case, really. So whenever he's been playing a match, you, you are seeing an increased number of tweets coming along. 
Uh, and obviously with the Germany Argentina sort of final going along, they, he was mentioned quite a lot on 13th of July. By the way, that's the that's the date I think to date that Twitter has had the maximum number of tweets going on. And again, you can see some of the uh, details of the conversations that's been taking place on Twitter at that time. But that doesn't give me. So again, there are some interesting trends around here. What I did want to bring was, you know, I've done a further analysis, gone by player by player to try and understand, you know, Arden Robin, when is that sort of happening, uh, to try and understand if there has been a real uh, killer. Because again, if you look at the trend there, the trends around 26th of June seems to be really high. And what I did find was Luis Suarez was mentioned quite a lot around the time of the 26th of June. Um, and again, further analysis of the Twitter content. So that's that's since time when he was um, uh, in the news quite a lot around the incident around fighting the Italian player, etc. Um, from a corporate perspective, what's interesting is that quite a lot of these tweets has been um, around Snickers. So if you go down, you, you can see that you know there, there's a lot of tweets around there, which is talking about people sort of saying, "Suarez, if you're hungry again, don't eat into an Italian, eat into a bite into a Snickers." I think it's a great use case of of a brand sort of latching on to some, um, something that's happening on the social media space to use that as an opportunity to put their brand in front of people. You know, they didn't have anything associated with Luis Suarez, but it was just sort of saying, well, Swiss Snickers is a good chocolate to have when you're really hungry. So I think they've just used the opportunity to really uh, get on, get out there, get to maximum number of people in terms of being being on their face. Uh, on Twitter or other social media sites. Um, I could go on with the demo, but in the interest of time, I'm going to move on. So moving back on to my uh, presentation there. Just to recap, what we saw in the demo is that, you know, how we could do is how to do some early stage analysis of social data using Excel. We connected to data collected through DataSift and saw how we could put the different attributes together into a dashboard through a JSON file. So, you know, at that point, I wasn't connecting to anything that was really sophisticated like a, a big data database or, or a big data data store. Anything. I was all doing all of that purely on my laptop, completely done using a JSON file. However, one of the things I'd like to bring through is, in, this, in that instance, we were using DataSift only as a tool to aggregate the conversations from the different social media services. Yes, DataSift does do that very well. You know, you can connect to the different data sources and bring it back to you in one particular one, just one stream. But there are a couple of other key challenges that, with social media analytics, that I think DataSift addresses really very well. For example, the ability to filter out the noise from the conversations. You know, where we went back and actually we had to, I had to spend quite a lot of time just to understand what is that analysis telling me because it was very hard because you were starting off with Hash World Cup, which is about you know, a large number of conversations that's happening online. So the ability to filter out any noise from the conversation and to bring back the information that is only relevant to your analysis, I think that's very key with DataSift. What they also do very well is, you know, subjecting the data through a, a very rigorous process of categorization, making it very easier for analysis. That's also very a very strong point of DataSift. And, and again, when we move on to the next demo, we'll look at that in a bit more detail. So uh, again, back on to um, a much more bigger demo now, and I think the, the context of the demo stays the same. So we've been talking about World Cup data, and that's what I've been listening to here as well. So uh, we've been collecting all of this social media data. Uh, again, now we are looking at Twitter, Facebook, uh, Reddit. Reddit's uh, sort of known as the Internet's newspaper, really. So people talking about uh, sharing on different forums. So we've been collecting, to, collecting information from Reddit and Tumblr. Um, and we've been listening to again the same hash World Cup hashtag on this on these different data sources. Now, as we go through this demo, and I'll, I'll actually focus on the brand was. I'm, I'm trying to bring in a bit more enterprise background to this sort of whole um, demo, really. And I thought I thought focusing on something like the Adidas versus Nike sort of brand was, I think, would be interesting. So we'll use that as a sort of business case as we go through it. But from an architecture perspective, we're collecting all of that data using DataSift. We've let DataSift run through this whole process, do a little bit of categorization as we go through it, but do a lot of filtering so that we can uh, filter out the noise from the data. And we've pumped all of that data into Google BigQuery. And I, I, I really love Google BigQuery from the perspective of, you know, it's very easy to set up. 
and it can handle large volumes of data, and you're not always sort of, you know, fighting with uh, cases of, you know, your query is taking a long time. Quite a lot of, um, as we go through the demo, you'll see that there is, it comes back with data very, very quickly. Um, and I've used Tableau for the visual and the visualization piece of things. So again, that is my reporting analytics tool. Um, again, from a ad hoc analysis perspective, I think it sits very well with the Google BigQuery piece. So let's just quickly jump on to Tableau now. I've got an instance of Tableau desktop open up here. Uh, for those of you who are new to Tableau, this is uh, this is uh, the workspace of Tableau desktop. So I've got to have a, a local installation on my machine here. Uh, and I'm connecting to the different data sources. So on the top left corner there, you see the different data sources that I have available for my analysis. Um, I'm connecting to, let me just quickly make this wider. I'm connecting on to DataSift via, I mean, Google BigQuery via DataSift, and I've collected all the FIFA data. The dimensions window in there is giving me the list of all the different attributes that it's listened to. So look, look at that. You can get all the Amazon values, Bitly, blogs, boards, daily motions, demographics, a lot of Facebook-related fields. Uh, you can also get things like Google+, Instagram, uh, interaction details. So interaction is where Dataset is trying to combine all these different data sources into one so that you don't have to do all of that work yourself. So you know, you just click on interaction say for example, content, and it will get you content from all these different data sources like Twitter, Tumblr, et cetera, into just one field. Um, you also have things like cloud, LexisNexis, which is a new space uh, data source on social media. Um, you get a lot of links. So again, like data shift taking, tracking through all the links that have been shared on social media through to the final endpoint that's been resolved. And again, giving you a lot of attributes around that. Um, you get the likes of news, cred, Reddit, topic strengths. The number of columns or fields that you have for analysis is huge. What I've done is, I mean, setup is quite easy. You have just pointed that onto Google BigQuery for the analysis, really. And Tableau is just looking at it and saying, oh, these are all the textual data that you have, so they must all be dimensions. Uh, and these are all the numbers that I found in that, and so they must all be measures. So again, this has given me a list of all the dimensions and measures. Let me quickly double click on number of records. So just to give you a, uh, what this does is, this goes back into Google BigQuery, and it's almost like, for the technical people out there, it's almost like just running a select const. So it gives you the number of records that are stored within that data set. And that query just literally ran into Google BigQuery live. So I'm now connected live to Google BigQuery on the cloud. It's gone back and come back and said it's about, got about 5 million records in that data set that's collected around World Cup. Um, as I said, you know, World Cup being the most tweeted about event, uh, it's impressive. Uh, the Germany-Brazil match had about 35,000 tweets every second coming through for Twitter. So, you know, it was, it was the biggest ever event happening on social media space there. Um, if I then sort of, you know, go in and look at timestamp, again, a lot of uh, fields, so I'll use the search functionality. I click on timestamp and I drag and drop that onto the columns. Again, in the interest of trying to look at a trend of interactions over time. So if I look at, give me a day level, and then if I get Tableau to draw up a chart for me that shows me the trend of interaction, so just to understand how many records have been ha coming through over the period of time. It's given me a line chart. Uh, there are some data issues, so I'll filter that data out, which is coming through us. Now, I'll also exclude some of these data that has been stored erroneously, so I'll exclude that data from the analysis. And what we should get now is a, is a trend chart that sort of shows our activity over the period of time. And again, that's pretty much what you would expect. Uh, I'm looking at, I'm listening to data from the 19th of July, so that's right from the group stages, uh, and we know now know what that peak is all about. We saw that on our Excel demo. Uh, that's Suarez biting the Italian player. And then again, it goes through its own peaks and troughs to come back on to the 4th of July when there's been a lot of discussions around the quarterfinals starting, so that's the first 4th of July there, uh, and the 8th of July, which is when the uh, Germany-Brazil match was going on, and that saw the maximum number of tweets, right up to the final, which was uh, the grand finale of, in terms of the number of tweets that came through in a day. So you can see that sort of trend on the chart. Uh, what I can do now is sort of drag and drop interaction type. Now Tableau allows me to do this sort of analysis to split that trend chart by different colors. So again, now I'm doing the analysis to say I'd be interested in looking at the types of uh, sources that's coming into that interaction. So hopefully Tableau should now come back and say where these different sources are. So now we're looking at, um, if I use a highlighter there, uh, that line at the bottom, uh, it looks very small, 
but the scale of the access is on uh, 50k. So uh, that's giving me blogs. There's been a little bit of activity on Facebook. Some on Reddit, but very little. Tumblr has seen some, but Twitter has been seeing the majority of the conversations. And I think you know that's that's all about the the lifespan. You know, the, the, you get into the philosophical question of you know how long does a uh, a social media conversation stay on? You know, how, what is the lifespan of a of a tweet? Um, and that sort of shows that, isn't it? Between the quarterfinals and the semifinals, and again between that finals, it's very hard to imagine that you know you'd expect that trust as well there. I would expect the activity to just keep on building on it, but people lose the interest. When there's a gap of three days between two matches, people lose the interest in that, and they're talking about something else. Uh, I think it's a very interesting philosophical question in terms of, you know, how long to the, uh, what is the lifespan of a social media tweet. Anyway, uh, what I have done in, in the interest of, again, trying to get it filtering down to the whole Adidas Nike sort of scenario, uh, I have gone ahead and filtered this data to make it a bit more, you know, reduce the complexity on it, and just look at the fields that we are interested in. So I'm now connecting to, again, the same data set data, but um, this is now filtered down to just the three areas that I'm interested in. And let's just quickly recreate that uh, trend chart that we had. So I'm bringing back a number of records in there, and I'm going to drag and drop, uh, drag and drop the timestamp onto the columns, and I'll bring that back to the day level. And let's look at the trend chart there. So that's giving me a different trend. Uh, that's now peaking on the 29th of June, interestingly. Uh, so we'll try and find out what that's, what's driving all of that. Um, I'll drag and drop the mentions onto the color because that will give me the three areas that I'm interested in. So the blue is Adidas, orange is Nike, and I've got Puma on green. Uh, very, very low. But they, they are the three top brands in terms of football gear, and I thought that was very interesting from a, uh, from a social media perspective. Um, Adidas had the uh, sponsorship for the event, so they were a main sponsor for FIFA. Nike, however, had 10 of the, uh, so they had the most number of team sponsorships. They had the most number of kits, etc. And you'd have seen all these sort of cartoons and sort of advertising campaigns that were out, out on social media um, and on televisions around the time of FIFA. So let's just quickly rename that to say trend charts. How am I doing for time? All right, okay, that's good. Um, and let's look at some other ways of analyzing that data. So I'll create a new chart, and we'll leave the trend charts in there. We'll come back onto that uh, in a bit. Um, let's, again, quickly bring in number of records. And what you can see here is I mean, the, among the different fields that we talked about, you could bring in things like demographics. So if I brought in gender, uh, what, what the demographics sort of uh, source does there is basically it goes back into the username and tries to identify the gender of a user based on their names. So it can't work out all of the names, so it'll go back and look at things like, you know, if we had something like Thurgood events, uh, a, Twitter, a Twitter account, go back and look at it and say, well, I can't find gender for it. And very often you'll come back and say it's got a null. Um, it'll get the females, and again, some of the names might be used mostly by females, uh, so you get a bit of female and mostly female, same with male and mostly male, and there might be names that's unisex, so again, it gives you that gender basis depending on, on the names, uh, on the user names itself. You can also do things like uh, hashtags, you know, based on languages. Uh, if I bring in something like languages, for example, it'll show me that the majority of the conversations have been happening on English, um, but it's English that's been skewing that up. So let me just quickly just, you know, uh, just hide that for a minute, and then you can see that, you know, there's been quite a lot of activities on the different you know, languages, Spain, for example, Japanese, French. So there are quite a lot of uh, interactions happening on different languages. You can drag and drop Twitter place countries. Uh, let's do this analysis on hashtags. So let me just clear that off. I'll, I'll remove that. And what I'll do is I'll bring in hashtags as one of the uh, ones that I'm interested in. And I'll, and I'll use Tableau's Show Me feature to drop a hashtag uh, and, again, give me a bubble or maybe not a bubble. I'll change that to a word cloud. So let me just quickly swap that on to a word cloud. So that's now giving me a list of all the hashtags that's been used where Adidas, uh, Nike, or Puma has been mentioned. And these are all the hashtags that's been used. Yeah? Uh, I think the message of the whole social media is slowly giving away with Robin being there pretty big, but we'll come back onto it. And I, I'd, I'd like to restrict that hashtag down to, say, a top 50. So let me just quickly do that. I'm saying I'm interested only in the top 50 by the number of records. So top 50 mentions, and that's all that I'm interested in. 
and let's just quickly rename that to say hash uh, tag cloud. Yeah. One of the great features of uh, DataSift is that it lets you get into the raw data if you wanted to get to. So um, let's bring that through. Yeah. So if I drag and drop something like uh, interaction content, it warns me that there are a lot of records in here. Um, if you look at it, that's every single message that's been said about the brand on social media. So you can see all of that there. And I can now filter that down by sorted by uh, a particular field. So let me bring it by retweet count and say that I'm interested in that by descending. So you've got that coming through, and let's call that interaction details. Well, that already exists, so let's call it interaction. Um, and then finally, what you would also have noted is that there is a lot of geospatial mapping going on with that. So if I double click on longitude and latitude, Tableau draws me a map of the world saying these are where the interactions have been happening. Uh, I will try and drag and drop the number of records onto the size. So the bigger the bubble, more interactions. I'll filter out the nulls. That gives me all the locations there. Let me just increase the size relatively um, and make the color a bit transparent. So darker the blues, you're getting more conversations happening. And bigger the bubble, the number of records are high. Uh, and let's call that the map. What Tableau will allow you to do at this point is to change. So if I make my size of the dashboard automatic, and then I can drag and drop these different trend charts into, into the view here. So I've got my trend chart coming through. I've got my hashtag cloud. I would like to have my interaction details in here. And let me also bring through the maps. So in one view, I've got all the different conversations that's happening. And maybe I don't need to know that the number of records and size is different. And let me just change the position of that. Uh, legend onto that chart so that I get a bit more of screen space. What I can do is also to use that as a filter. So now when I click on that chart, for example, it then filters out every single conversation to say, all right, that peak has been when people have been speaking about Mexico and Robin quite a lot. And what have they speaking, been speaking about Robin? That's when Robin jumped in sort of, you know, uh, and faked to fall really to get, get a free kick. Anyway, in the interest of time. So you can carry on with the analysis in that piece. The other sort of aspect of data shift is that it gives you a lot of cloud score, scoring that's available for your analysis. Uh, I've got a slide here that sort of quickly talks about uh, what is a cloud score. So a cloud score is a number between 1 to 100 that represents your influence. So the more influential you are, the higher your cloud score. Yeah? And the influence is actually being rated by your ability to drive action. So, and, and you can actually uh, manipulate this to some extent. So if you've got presence across different social media sites and you tweet across these different or you are interacting across these social media sites very actively across a different, a large number of users, so your cloud score goes high. And again, just to give you a sort of, uh, a sort of related picture there, Barack Obama has got a cloud score of 99. So that's, that's sort of, he's rated as the most influential person on the internet. He's got his own sort of, he's got Twitter teams and Facebook teams. He's also got a dedicated sort of Wikipedia page. That sort of gives you a, uh, you know, where, where you are. Um, I, I'm on 48 and, you know, typically you find people in that range of between 50 to 70. But why is the cloud score important? From a, uh, from a marketing sort of enterprise perspective or a campaign analysis perspective, you almost always want to target people with a higher cloud score because then you're reaching out to the maximum number of people online. So what I have done here is I've created a dashboard on Tableau uh, that sort of lists down, gives me a maximum score of uh, cloud score at any point in time. So again, if I just highlight Adidas in there, it's telling me on that particular date or on that particular time, the max cloud score was uh, 20. Yeah, 40, sorry, 42. And then, sorry, what I have also done is I've done an eight-week moving average just to smoothen out the curves a bit. So you can see how the Adidas' cloud score, max cloud score has been looking over that period of time. How does it look for Nike and how does it look for Puma? Interestingly, Adidas, with all their social media campaign, have managed to achieve their lowest cloud score is, you know, is much higher than the Nike rates that you're seeing. And I think they've done a good job from a campaign perspective. So even when Nike gathered all that sort of conversations around RJ Robin and, you know, RJ Robin being kickstarted by Nike, et cetera, even when they gathered all the conversation around uh, that particular player uh, on the FIFA World Cup, Adidas has done a good job by 
being on top of their social media campaign and making sure that the, they're always targeting people with, with a higher cloud score. So that's, that's how you'd work with that from a marketing campaign perspective. Uh, one final point I'd like to touch upon in my demo is how do you bring all of this data into, into your corporate analysis? So uh, let's look at an instance if you had something like a marketing intelligence dashboard where you've got your sales revenue trend uh, and your sales revenue by brand showing up. Uh, what you can do is you can actually bring this trend chart. So let me just quickly rename that to say uh, social media trend. So that's, that's giving you a social media trend. And you can actually drag and drop that particular value in here into your analysis and you can start to look at, again, you don't, you don't need to see uh, these legends because that should be the same brand in there. You can start to see the social media trend alongside your sales revenue trend, which in your organizations should come from your own systems. So or you might have an EPOS system that gives you uh, an indication of what is your sort of sales trend across. And you should then be able to look for like for like. In this instance, you can't look at it because, again, I'm looking at sort of uh, – data that's been trawled through from different stock exchanges and financial information. So I'm looking at a quarter that's before the football time period here. So that doesn't really make sense. But if, if you could match with your internal data, if you could match like for like, you should then hopefully be able to say that, that you saw a peak in Nike at the time of 29th of June, and that then reflected back in your internal sales at, at certain, such, such and such period. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the data uh, that Nike or Adidas would have had internally around their sales, so we can't show the dashboard here. But again, you should be able to bring that linking through. So I'm clicking on Nike here as a as a report, and then it highlights Nike on social media trend and highlights Nike on the sales revenue trend as well. And I could do the same for Adidas as well. So that's the sort of position where you want to get to, where you know social media just sits in your organization just as another data source. That sort of nicely takes me into my next slide that I had uh, around you know, the positioning of where do you see social data. I think uh, working with customers, where we are trying to get to a position is where social data, you've done all your ex homework around uh, making sure that you're listening to the right things, et cetera, but you have brought it into an instance where it sits alongside your external data. It could be your repos, could be your, uh, you know, anything that you're getting from a market share perspective. Uh, and sits along there and is feeds into, you know, can be brought into your business intelligence and analytics uh, platforms. So back on our social media analysis journey, let us quickly just summarize what we've reviewed so far. We've looked at different ways to collect data. We reviewed some powerful analysis that you can perform in the data, and we saw a few examples of dashboards that you could create. The actions that you could drive from this analysis, I think, is threefold. So you're looking at being able to evaluate whether you're listening to the right audience and making the right investment. So again, it gives you a very good feel for what's, what the market is telling you. The ability to relate to what is driving the activity. So once you've listened, you've picked up trends in the, on the social media space, you should then be able to relate that to the activity that you're seeing. And how does that tie in with your own initiatives in terms of you know increased marketing campaigns, et cetera? And, Finally, you want to be able to derive new insights and to use them to influence new outcomes or desired outcomes that you would like to uh, derive out of the campaigns that you're running. Hopefully, you've, you've seen some of the interesting possibilities with social media analytics today with all of that demo, and hopefully there are some learnings that you can take back and you know, use for further analysis within your own organizations. Uh, and there are different use cases that we've come across uh, over the period that we've been working with some of our customers. Uh, one of the high street banks that we work with have successfully been using social media analysis to maintain the track record of their customer service team, for example, by tracking negative sentiments raised by customers on social media. Um, in another instance, one of our clients who's been a, who's a very well-established CPG company uh, has been monitoring the effectiveness of their you know, marketing campaign. So remember we looked at cloud analysis earlier on. They've been using similar sort of analysis to try and understand what their effectiveness of their marketing material is. And then again, to try and tweak that to try and make sure that they're hitting the right target, right, use, right business audience, et cetera. Our recommendation in this space would be to always try and focus on, on the business value first, really. If you, are, if you are unsure, I know this sounds like a message from sponsor, but if you are unsure on how to validate the business case, I'm sure we can help. So please don't hesitate to reach out. I've got a slide at the end that talks about sort of uh, our contact details, et cetera. And when you've identified that area that you could benefit from the analysis, 
then always start by listening to the conversations around your brand or service. Due to, you know, this webinar is a very short period, so we haven't got into any details around the offerings of the likes of Radiant Sticks or, you know, even data shift in that space. Um, and again, that's an area, if you're interested, if that's something that's very interesting to you, please get back in touch with us and we'd be happy to discuss that in more detail. Uh, the business case that you thus you sort of you know gather and the listening notes from your listening exercise, et cetera, should definitely give you an op indication of the opportunity and the challenges that it presents. So just to summarize from my session today, I think uh, key observations. You know, we are no longer at the point where we're thinking, oh, is social media important? Social media, I think, matters. It is important as we see it today. It's not, not at all expensive to try. It's, it's the sort of architecture we talked about earlier, using data Shift, Google BigQuery, and Tableau, uh, or, or even Excel, is, is very, 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 I mean, comparative, comparative costs are very low, and so, so it's not at all expensive to try, but it could be very costly to ignore. So if you're ignoring it and your competitor is already on social media analytics, you're actually probably on the back foot in terms of you know, uh, being ahead of the competition. Always, always, I mean, I, I know we speak about this on many of our other webinars, always focus on the value of insights to the business. That has got to be the key. Never do social media analytics just because you've got to do it. Always try and do it with, uh, with business value in hand, uh, in mind. And technical challenges are always manageable. You know, you'd come across things like, you know, large volumes of data. We had one of the biggest technical challenges for the demo today where Twitter had the maximum volume of data. You know, that didn't stop us from doing the demo today. So it's always manageable when we are here to help. So you know, don't let that stop stop you from uh, doing this. With that, we come to the end of our webinar. Thank you very much for your time and hope you found this session useful. Thank you very much for your attention.